Thank you, Alexandra. So welcome to this talk on MISP Web Scraper. I'm Koen van Impe. I work as a freelancer in incident response and threat intelligence and also maintain the OSINT feed botvrij.eu. And exactly when maintaining this feed that I encounter some problems, I create a small tool to help me fix these problems. And I want to share this tool and present this here. Um, so when I add data to botvrij.eu, typically read a couple of blog posts, white papers, OSINT information has been published. Then do making some sense of it and trying to convert it to a MISP threat event. Now, this conversion just requires a lot of time. Tedious work, copying, pasting, not the most challenging work. But when I started with botfred.e, one of the ideas was also not to include only just an indicator list. Already a lot of these lists are available, but also include some contextual information. For example, if you add an IP address to the list, also describing what does this IP address do? How does it relate to the other objects that are included in MISP threat events? Now, if you look at the sources that I use to feed the botfred.e uh, feed, so a lot of these public reports they contain mostly unstructured information, which is well, really uncomfortable if you want to add this to, to a feed, because that requires me to go through all this unstructured information and making some sense of it and putting it again in a structured format. Often I have the idea that a lot of these public reports, they made for readers and not so much for consumers, which is, well, it might have been a little bit stupid because if you publish something, it's good to read about it. It's good to know what exactly is this threat campaign, what is this threat actor doing. But after reading this information, also want to do something with it. And this is not something that goes very easy. Um, often end up in this workflow, we have very smart people doing some collection of data, putting it in a structured format. Then something happens and it gets published in an unstructured format. And then to use it, I have to go through that entire process again, making some sense of it, putting it in a structured format, and then encoding it into um, MISP. So I'm not here about talking about solving the sharing problem, but more about solving the how can we make these public reports a little bit more accessible? How can we make them more usable for, uh, for users? And I know for making these public reports more usable for others, there might be some commercial constraints. So if you make these reports available to others, you're going to make your competitors even smarter than they already are. So I might understand there's some commercial constraints for not immediately doing that, but still you can make it as a, use it as a kind of a teaser. And for example, make the structured information already available to your potential customers. Now, not everything is bad. So there are already a couple of companies that publish information in structured format. For example, Palo Alto, um, Asset, and, and Viso, they already publish information in structured format. Now, if you look at the formats that are available, we have six, six very nice formats, technically very interesting. Unfortunately, not a lot of organizations, not a lot of, not a lot of users are using it. CSV and text files, all good and well, but <laughs> Not always in a, used in a consistent manner. CSV files, for example, the sequence of fields that are used in that CSV file often changes. Not always that easy to, to integrate. Uh, PDF files and Excel files, having public reports with description of a threats campaign, and then only having a PDF file or an Excel file, maybe not that good to, to use. Ideally, everyone would be start using the MISP core format. But unfortunately, we are not there yet. Now, Clearly, I'm not the only one struggling with this problem. For example, on the assets, uh, GitHub repository, there's also someone asking for all good and well that you publish this very interesting data, but can we have it in more structured format? So this is one of the problems that I faced. And that's when I started building MISP Scraper, which is just basically a Python script. It's a Python script that fetch, that uses a list of RSS feeds. <laughs> it collects these RSS feeds, extracts all the URLs that are in this RSS feed, then um, visits, visits these URLs, makes a MISP event, attaches a MISP report, and from this MISP report, it extracts the indicators and the TTPs. Um, now this last part, adding a MISP report, extracting the indicators and the TTPs, that's something that I did not have to invent on my own. It already existed. Um, if you're not familiar with MISP reports, so MISP reports are a way to attach to an existing MISP event a CTI report. You can do it in a text format or in a markdown format. You can add one or multiple MISP reports. And the nice thing about it is if you share a MISP event with your constituency, 
these MISP reports that are attached to the MISP events, they also get shared, which is a very nice feature. You do not only have the threat information, you also have the threat report. One of the features in MISP report is also that it allows you to add references to objects and attributes that exist in your MISP event. Not only the objects and attributes, but also the taxonomies and the galaxies. Now, this solved already one of my problems, having an easy way to extract indicators and TTP. So once I create that MISP report from a crawled website, there's a feature in the MISP report uh, code that allows me to extract these indicators and TTPs. Next, there's a, a MISP module that allows you to do a conversion from HTML to Markdown. So I give the MISP report uh, module a URL. It goes crawl the, this website, gets the HTML, and that HTML then gets converted to Markdown. This is already the next thing of my problem that's been solved. And lastly, there's also a feature in MISB reports that allows you to automatically extract entities. So I don't have to do this on my own. This is already built in the MISB report feature, giving it a URL, crawling that, that URL, that website, creating a MISB report of it, and then extracting the entities and the uh, TTPs. Now, I build my tool around these existing features from the MISB report and added some additional things. So for example, there's a Flask web interface. A Flask web interface allows you to manually submit one URL. So by default, it works through a cron job, cron job built in into the Python script that fetches these URL, these RSS feeds, visits all the URLs. But if you encounter a URL that you want to manually scrape, you just add it through the Flask web interface and it's going to crawl it for you. Um, all these URLs, so manually or through the cron job, they're added to a Redis queue. And then there's another component, all in that same Python script. There's another component that reads every URL that's been pushed on that Redis script, on that Redis queue, and then crawls these URLs and converts them to MISP event and a MISP report. Now, the way that you have to use this MISP scraper, typically you're going to use it in a dirty MISP environment, um, a MISP environment that you only use to crawl all these websites. By default, the new events that are created they're set in a workflow incomplete, and then you have to do some curation. You have to do some verification. Are the crawled events, are they useful for me? Do they contain relevant indicators? Are there any errors, errors that occurred? Once you're happy with the result, and I'll come to the curation a little bit later. If you're happy with the result, you switch the workflow state from incomplete to complete. You publish the event, and the event gets then synchronized to your clean MISP instance that you can then use to distribute information to your, your constituency. Um, about that curation, so a couple of checks that I add through the script to, to, to help with the curation. One of the things is the HTTP error code. So when curation happens, normally we should get an HTTP 200 code. In some cases, the website refuses that you visit the, the the, the crawling, let's go back. The crawling happens through the MISB report. MISB report uses the Python user agent. Some websites refuse that you visit this website with the user agent Python. So, and then you get an HTTP error code 403. Some other websites, they don't give you an, an HTTP error code. They just give you another HTML error. And then another HTML web page where they describe you're not allowed to visit this page with the user agent Python. But you don't get an error code by, so to help the curation, I just display the HTTP error codes in one of the tags. Um, one of the additional things to do for curation is verify if the scraped website is useful. Um, so if you scrape these your, uh, feeds from, these URLs from the RSS feed, there are a couple of links that are not relevant or are not really threat reports. For example, the, Yearly figures, the statistics that companies publish, these get also scraped and also created as a MISP event and as a MISP report. These are things maybe that you don't get rid of. Uh, one of the problems with the automatic crawling and automatic extraction of indicators and TTPs is that some of the attributes get a wrong category and type. An example here is the um, long file name, which has been recognized by MISP as its uh, host name. So these are the things during creation that you have to do. Then next also false positives. False positives, something you can handle with uh, the warning list. And then mass edit of attributes. So sometimes attributes are extracted from the, the website that are useful as contextual information. For example, command.exe is used, netstat.exe is used. 
useful to have these attributes in that MISP event, but you don't want to have the IDS flag set to true. And if you have a lot of these attributes, instead of doing this manually and checking them one by one, you can just do a mass edit. You select all the attributes and you can select the two IDS fields in bulk. You can also do the same for the correlation field. You can just switch that with one, one form. And next to that, also a lot of attributes, for example, um, naming conventions of malware get added automatically. Something that you maybe do not want to push to, to your customers. This is something that you can then do with mass delete of attributes. Uh, to help my work, my creation a little bit more, uh, because but it's all in the free time. So, uh, one of the checks that the script does before it creates a MISP event is going to check based on the title of the HTML, the HTML tag, the title there, it checks if that MISP event already exists. If it already exists, it's not going to create, recreate a MISP event. There's a retention feature, and the retention feature deletes old events. So if you run the script from Chrome every four hours, every six hours, and if you don't have the time to attend to newly created MISP events, but after a while, that dirty MISP environment is just going to explode with a lot of MISP events that you do not have time to, to create. So every MISP event that is older than two days, seven days, depending on retention, gets automatically deleted. And also add some additional classification, for example, the source where the website was crawled, and some of the like TLP white codes that are immediately added. Um, also to add a little bit on the attributes that need to be removed after they have after the website have been crawled, I created a custom warning list. All the elements that are on this custom custom warning list, they are automatically removed from a MISP threat event. So these are, for example, the the strings that the social media accounts that companies put on their website, if you scrape these websites, these social media accounts are recognized by MISP sometimes as, as an indicator. Um, links to external partner websites. If you scrape these websites over and over again, you know that these attributes are not relevant for, uh, for sharing. So by putting them on a custom warning list and setting that in configuration, everything that matches with this custom warning list is automatically removed. Um, when I create the the scraped event also add a little bit of uh, comment. So there's one attribute, comment attribute added with the the source, the, the 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 source of the website, the RSS feed that's being used, and the title of the page. I'm not going to go into much detail, but this is just how a scraped event, MISP event looks like. Now, based on my experience from using this tool for a couple of weeks, what works well. Um, Everything basically that's easy recognizable by regular expressions, because that's the way that this automatic extraction works. Automatic extraction from through the MISP report feature. So hashes, IP addresses, almost always successful. What often works are URLs, domain names, and host names. Email source, most of the time. TTPs, as long as they are not part of the social, of the commercial text on a website. What sometimes work but more not done, yes, is uh, file names and registry keys. Um, Alexander opened the conference which saying that, okay, you have to share what works, what's also your failures. It gives, it saves me a little bit of time maintaining the bot for uh, the, the feed, but it's not an ideal solution. So at the end of the talk, I'm going to cover a little bit of the improvement possibilities. So some of the things work, some of the things didn't work. Um, so if you want to use it, and it's on all on GitHub. If you want to use it, installation is re relatively easy. Just enable the MIS modules. So the MIS modules for HTML to Markdown, set up a virtual Python environment, and you have to change that scrape.py config file. Just a little bit of settings there. There's one configuration for the uh, the log file. So everything that the scraper does get logs to it, uh, the log file. You need to change the location where you find the RSS feeds, so the, the feed list. Um, and then the MISP API key and the MISP URL, obviously, because otherwise it's not going to work. The feed list configuration file is just very simple. JSON file, title, and URL. And if you are in search for some inspiration for good RSS feeds, I have an OPML uh, GitHub repository that you can use. Just There's a feed link there that you can use to import in your RSS reader. Um, so room for improvement. It was a very fun experiment to write this and to help me save a little bit of time when maintaining uh, botfrey.ae. But the user agent blocked. It's if you get an error, HTTP error message, it's easy recognizable. I can tag it. 
The other problem with sites not returning an HTTP error code, but just returning a different HTML page, like, and mostly with CDNs, they say, okay, you're not allowed to visit this page, and you get another HTML page in return with an HTTP 200 status code. That's very annoying, because then you have to go through this code manually. One way of solving this would, for example, to be uh, with the IEL Splash Manager and emulate browsers. That might be one of the other ways, instead of using the Python user agent, using Splash Manager for, for visiting these websites. Um, Doc Intel, and we're going to hear about this thing later on, might also be one of the ways to look at this. I um, also already worked a little bit about solving this problem with the user agent. So there's already a feature where you can submit raw HTML. So once the page is scrolled through whatever means, once you get the HTML, you can already submit it through that Flask web user interface to create from this raw HTML already a MISP report. So there's already some work being done, including screenshots, but I think that would already help because including screenshots of the original public report also gives us a visual impression, okay, this is what's being published there. Um, some of the RSS files that I found, some of the uh, companies that publish their blog posts through an RSS feed, they include the articles even from 2010, which is very annoying if you just set up this scraper, if you want to try it in a couple of environments. If you have all the articles going back to 2010, that means that all these web pages are also crawled. No, that's not really ideal. Um, another way, instead of using regular expressions to extract TTPs and, and indicators, might have to use maybe natural language processing. There was a talk at um, first in, in Ireland this year. I was not able to attend that talk, but that might be maybe one of the things to look at. Um, a bulk change category and type in MISP, that would really be helpful, because now if you want to change category and type for one attribute, that works. If you want to change it for 10 attributes, is a lot of work. So having a bulk change would really be uh, useful. Um, and then also um, automatically remove attributes for specific scraped sources. And to explain this a little bit, so this is one of the um, side effects that you get, for example, from crawling websites from Trend Micro. On Trend Micro website, they have links to all the regional websites and all the industries that they work for. Or understandable, but except that with automatic extraction through MISB reports, it recognizes this as the industries and the targets, the, the, the geographical targets. But this is not only annoying because it gets added automatically. One of the ways to remove this would, for example, to filter out on basic, on specific CSS classes and creating a profile per website that you're going to crawl and that you indicate this CSS class is something for this website I want to exclude. Another way of helping the curation would be that you can do a mass delete of clusters. Because now if the, all these clusters are added, and this is just a very small example, there are some other scraping that gave ridiculous amount of uh, clusters. So now you have to click on the delete per cluster individually, and instead of gaining time, yeah, <laughs> losing a little bit of time. So this is one of the, the, the ways to, uh, to uh, that could improve this. Um, so sharing the experience on building this tool, it was a very good experiment. Experiment. It helps me a little bit with maintaining botfrey.eu. It's not ideal, so there's still a lot of um, of improvement. Um, and but I think the easiest way would be if everyone just uses the MIST core format. Um, I, I know this is not not going to happen, but I think it might, it would help. But it would mostly help if all these public reports, which contain such good information, instead of focusing on readers, focus on people that want to use it, because that's something that I find very frustrating. Very good article, everything is published there. And then if I want to use it, but I have to copy paste all that information and you make errors and it's time consuming and everyone who is doing that work is doing that again and again and again. I think it's very, it's a waste of time. Um, the tool is on GitHub and there's a short blog post on the MISP project website where you can read about the usage. Um, and if you have any questions, you can always uh, reach out to me. I'll just leave that one here. That's great. Thank you very much. Okay. I have two good news for you. <laughs> uh, the first one is about the scrapping. 
so we released just today something called LACUS, which is a new framework that is using Playwright that will be used for Ale, Lukilu, and other tools that we are developing, and it's open source, to basically manage scrapping through Playwright. Okay. And it's uh, and you have a simple Python interface. Okay, nice. So that's uh, the first thing. The second thing is you mentioned Patrick. Who is Patrick? Where is Patrick? I think he's drinking beer somewhere. Um, he's here. Yeah, I saw that. It, okay, he has so a talk tomorrow, so I'm going to, to reach out to him. <laughs> awesome. That's great. Okay. Is there any questions? Yeah. So, uh, thanks. I, I just want to share a few uh, um, experience about uh, scraping because I'm also doing scraping. I, I will show tomorrow uh, what uh, we can do. Uh, but things that I found really useful uh, for file names is just to filter uh, based on the extension, the file extension. So what I did is that I took all the file names that were in MISP, just extracted the uh, extension for all these attributes, and then took the top one, and I only extract those. And uh, for registry keys, I, you have a set of keywords that are common in a, and only keeping those also helped me to just improve the, the quality without uh, increasing um, the workload. Um, second things, I'm, I'm using um, so browser automation to, um, to uh, be able to get the screenshots, and those were like super useful when you do that at scale. Yeah. Because scraping will fail, but the screenshot is always there. Okay. Yeah. You cannot copy-paste, but you can still do OCR and that kind of stuff if you really are lost. Um, and I know that one extra point, sorry. Yeah, um, in the end, I, I have uh, another experiment where I use uh, Scrapy to scrape the web. I'm looking for threat reports. And in the end, what gave me the, the best quality was to have um, custom scrapers per website where you can really filter and get the content of each article. But it's a pain in the ass to maintain. Yeah, the goal here was to, to gain some time because this is all done in, in free time. And finding the balance there, it's, I think it's challenging and interesting to do that, but currently I don't have the time to do that. Well, what you said about for the registry keys and so, that would be useful if that gets integrated in the MISP report feature. Because it's not that the scraper uses it, but if you import it in the MISP report feature, but we are all happy then. I will create new issues for, uh, for them to add. Uh, and also the um, uh, readability, uh, extension in browser is really helpful to get rid of all the ads, the menu and all that. So you, you might want to have a look at that. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. More questions? See one in the back. Yeah. Stretching. People are stretching sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions? All good? Okay. Again, thank you very much. Thanks.